Kevin. Yeah, thank you, Brandon. Uh, yeah, so I know we haven't talked about supply chain enough already, so I figured we could spend some time on that today. But before we do, a fun fact I just learned from uh, the Bird app is that Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy was released on October 12th, 1979, which would be exactly 42 years ago today. That's your fun fact. If you learn nothing else from this talk, you can tell your friends that fun fact. So today is the 42nd anniversary of that. Uh, so yeah, I, I'm really honored to be here and speak with you. Um, I'll introduce myself in more detail in a little bit, um, but I want to talk first about a story because... You know, I think a lot of what we've heard about securing the supply chain and, and you know, great tools around doing it maybe doesn't have all of the historical context uh, that we, we can give it. And, and so it's, it's important to think back, you know, in our history. When I, I say in our history, I don't mean like you know, the early days of Kubernetes. I don't mean before Kubernetes existed. I don't mean uh, really any history you or I uh, were around for, you know, this before Hitchhiker's Guide for the Galaxy, long before. And, you know, it, it, over the entire history of, like, human society, um, where we've organized ourselves into a society and then had adversarial relationships with other human beings, uh, there's always been supply chain attacks. It's always been a feature of adversarial relationships. There were wars over many years that were won and lost on you know, the ability to control uh, your supply chain or that of your adversary. In fact, you know, entire civilizations have either thrived or perished uh, because of their supply chain or logistics. In fact, in The Art of War, uh, Sun Tzu writes that the line between disorder and order lies in logistics. So this is something that's been around a really long time. Uh, and the reason we're talking about it so much right now in our industry and in software is because, you know, we've got this concept that software has eaten the world. And because of that, um, now this kind of long ago, you know, supply chain style attack that we've seen uh, is now something we see in, in software. And so it's not that new, right? It goes back to times long before. And so in that sense, the, you know, the SolarWinds attack that, you know, is uh, uh, oftentimes cited as, you know, one of the key uh, attacks that we saw to make us all think more about supply chain isn't really that new, uh, but it also doesn't mean that there's nothing to learn from it. And so uh, I think it's been mentioned a few times today in this conference, but SolarWinds themselves actually spoke at the uh, Supply Chain Security Conference yesterday. Uh, and so they had fantastic technical details in that talk about you know, all of the technical things that went wrong, went right, all of the efforts their team put in uh, after the event. Um, I want to talk about some of those today, but I, I also want to talk about the human factors and then some other factors that we don't often you know, bring into the discussion around supply chain. Um, because it's not just about this you know, single event. Um, it's kind of easy to point the finger and say, oh, here's, here's the thing that shows us supply chain is important. Um, but you know, it, it's, it's not new. Again, it's, it's not new, and we're going to talk about why. In fact, you know, one of the, the victims of this uh, attack uh, was actually the first people to report it, FireEye. Uh, they previously had written a report to uh, NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, called the Supply Chain Risk Management Report. Uh, and they had talked about how organizations putting, uh, you know, greater and greater security and, and maturing their security position to the rest of the world is, is a good thing, but it means that adversaries will necessarily go up the chain or down the chain in the supply chain to then attack um, their real targets, right? Because SolarWinds wasn't even the target of this attack that we all call, you know, SolarWinds or Sunburst attack. And that's, an, and that's important. It's worth, it's worth knowing just a little bit more about what happened so that we can talk about that. So if you weren't familiar with the details of the attack, again, yesterday, you can get the real deal from, from the firsthand source if you watch the, uh, the videos from yesterday. Um, but just to give you a little flavor, you know, it wasn't this kind of like full-scale assault that you might think of 
when, when you think of an attack, right? Uh, it was, and it wasn't against the intended target, right? SolarWinds was not who was targeted uh, in this attack. They targeted SolarWinds so that they could get at their real targets, um, right? The customers that SolarWinds had who relied heavily on the software that SolarWinds was producing, um, you know, they installed that software pervasively throughout their networks, um, you know, gave it expansive permissions, and then accepted, you know, updates directly from SolarWinds, and that's what made them vulnerable uh, to an attack on SolarWinds as part of their supply chain. Uh, and again, just to kind of give a little bit more of a detailed overview um, from, from what we know, is, you know, this attack wasn't even one point in time. Uh, the attackers were very sophisticated and originally gained access to uh, the CICD build structure, or build infrastructure, rather. SolarWinds build infrastructure. And that gave them the ability to, to inject their own code into the pipeline um, where SolarWinds was building the Orion product. And at first they kind of just tested this, right? They didn't really um, deliver the real payload. There was this thing called Sunspot where they were just kind of testing to see would they be detected, right? They inserted these DLLs, uh, named them things that you know, looked like and sound like classes that SolarWinds was already using in the package, so they didn't really, they wanted to know, are, they, are we gonna be noticed? Uh, and when they realized that they were able to get away with it, then they uh, released Sunburst, which was the, the real Trojanized code that got injected into the Orion software. But even that wasn't the end goal, right? So then they moved, removed all the malware that they had from the, from the VMs where the builds were happening, and the code was signed um, to try and cover their tracks. And then it wasn't until later that they then activated um, the, the code uh, to understand, you know, to, to actually get at the attackers, the, uh, the targets that they were looking at. And it was kind of aptly pointed out by um, Slowen CEO in a, in a blog about it, that, you know, they're not the only ones that have this kind of infrastructure, this, you know, build machines that are signing code. Um, they're definitely not the only ones uh, vulnerable to this type of thing. And that's you know, kind of the point of this talk, right? We have this kind of web of dependencies, and we're going to talk about that in more detail. Um, but as we build our modern infrastructure on top of you know, more and more dependencies, um, you end up building on you know, something that eventually you don't know, right? And you have this little, little piece uh, holding up everything else. And so we're going to talk about that today. Um, and again, I, as promised, I introduce myself. I'm Brendan O'Leary. Uh, I'm a developer evangelist at GitLab. Uh, I had the inverse problem that Dan Pop was talking about, um, or no, sorry, that uh, Dan Lorenz was talking about. You know, his hair grew out from worrying about supply chain. I used to have hair before I thought about supply chain security, now I don't. Um, so, you know, take that as it, as it may. So, you know, we talk about these dependencies, right? We saw that funny XKCD that talks about dependencies. Um, and again, we've talked a lot about that today and these, these tools to search for dependencies and talked about the software build materials and all these things. But I want to really define what that is because I think it's really important to this concept of supply chain security. Um, so of course, a dependency is, you know, traditionally what we think of is a open source dependency that we bring into our project, a library to do something better, um, to interact with a known API, to interact with... Um, you know, piece of hardware maybe we're using, right? And so this is some data from uh, the Activerse report that shows, you know, the percentage of, of uh, projects in different languages that use open source dependencies. This is not news, right? We talked about this some, this morning. But one thing that that doesn't cover uh, is transitive dependencies. So the, the graph we just saw was dependencies, things we specifically call out in a package manager file or elsewhere to say, hey, we've made a decision to include this library uh, into our product. Now, the problem is, the, or, or a concern there is, that those dependencies come with dependencies of their own, right? And so you end up with this web of dependencies that come along with it, right? And so this kind of graph kind of shows us that, and um, as an amateur-ish node developer, I can attest to that JavaScript line right there. Like, if you just look at node modules on this computer in any file, you'll, you'll see that that, that bears, bears out. 
Um, but these are the transitive dependencies that we bring in uh, as we're adding these other dependencies. But it's not even just that, right? Like that makes sense. We've got open source libraries, we've got the code we write, right? That's part of what you know, are, is included in our final product. Again, that's not new. And then we said, okay, it's not those libraries, it's also other third-party libraries that we bring in. Maybe those are you know, ones that come along with these open source dependencies. Maybe they're closed source ones, you know, uh, things you use to access the operating system or from some vendor that, again, hardware vendor or some API we're using that's, that's closed, right? But that the library then really is a dependency as well. And then of course, both of those have their own open source and maybe closed source dependencies, right? This is where when leftpad gets taken out of the NPM registry, all of a sudden nobody can build, right? Not that many people were pulling leftpad to pad some numbers into their code, but they had depended on something that was doing, you know, how they were doing their Ajax calls and that thing was depending on left pad, right? And, and then there's more, right? So then, then you have, what about our DevOps process, right? We, we heard this this morning. What about all the things that we're doing to get code into production? That is a dependency. Um, we have saw that in the SolarWinds attack, right? It's a, that is a clear dependency to our production environment. And then there's our production environment. And then of course, in there are a bunch of other vendors with a big S and they have a lot of open source dependencies that they rely on, and they probably have a lot of closed source proprietary stuff they rely on, right? So this web gets a lot bigger than just, oh, these are the dependencies called out in my files. And so I think it's key to understand that the sum total of all those dependencies really is what you should think of when you're talking about a supply chain. Um, and so, <clears throat> so, okay, so let's talk about then what is a supply chain? So we got to move oh, on. I thought we had 20 minutes. No, it was just 10. Oh, um, great. Sorry, that must have been a change. That. Okay, well, the rest of the talk is online. If you'd like to take a look at that, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tweet it out uh, soon on O'Leary Crew, and I'll, I'll let you know. All right, thanks, Brandon. Yeah, thank you. All right. Um,